runs this gap. Same thing in uh, deposits, the saving process. People have short-term money, uh, but they have to finance their pensions. Then we have to manage a way between the money they have and the pensions in, in 30 years. Uh, same thing on the corporate, any corporation. They have program to finance, they have investment to finance, and so on. And uh, they need long-term money, they need five years, six years money, and they don't have that money. And then you have the, the, the citizens uh, that have short-term money, and there is short-term money somewhere, long-term money somewhere. All the problem is the time. There is a time gap between all those things. Then the financial industry is just about intermediating time, to simplify things. But in reality, time between short term and long term, that is creating risk. Uh, this gap is the origin of risk. And in reality, the, the function of the financial industry is not just time, but it's risk. Because risk is not invention, it's not an invention of the financial people. Risk is a reality of the real world in the real economy, the real, the, 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 the real economy side. Okay? When uh, GDF Suez uh, is trying to build a dam somewhere in Brazil, there is a major risk. Then if they want to win this deal, it's not just a question of engineering and physics, it's also a process of how the financial engineering will cover the risk of this dam. Uh, and this, this risk is about complexity and so on, but also because of time. Then, then uh, there is other key words which, is, uh, which are important is that the, most, the more we go in a globalized, globalized and modern uh, world, the more we generate risk and complexity. That is the given. And uh, in front of that, it's like a, an engine, a systemic process, you have some input, you have a process, and you have output. And what is the value? In one side of the system, you have risk and complexity. At the other side of the system, you must have security and simplicity. Then the financial function is to transform, it's a catalyst, is to transform risk and complexity into security and simplicity. It's all about bonds, equities, derivatives, credit, deposit and credit. It's all about that. You can simplify this model. One side is there, the other side is there. That value creation of the financial industry for the real economy is how we are able to transform that to that. And here we can make a link with the crisis. What happened in the crisis in the 2000s is that the engine worked badly and the answer of the financial industry to complexity and risk was the creation of complex product. complex product and risky product and uh, and that's why we exploded the system exploded then what is important in that what is the challenge for the academic world the work for research is how to really bring an, uh, an answer which is will be simple. And to make this transformation between complexity to simplicity, you need a lot of innovation. And the other key word is innovation. Okay. 
We need innovation to really transform that. But as uh, all those processes are complex, you need another keyword, which is regulation. Which another contradiction. If you see, here you have some concept, and those concepts are contradictory to those concepts. And, and some people think that innovation is in opposition to regulation. In reality, we need both. And that is the equation that we have to deal with. How, from risk complexity, through innovation, we'll be able to deliver security, simplicity, and robustness. And robustness is regulation. That is the process on which uh, we are working. Now, another um, concept which is interesting, important to understand is that we all agree that the enemy in the society is risk. And the financial industry is like a big uh, nuclear plant. If you badly manage this nuclear plant here, you explode. And that's what the crisis demonstrates. It's not a theory, it's a pra it's practice. Then it's a, it's a plant. That the enemy is risk. And here I will take this uh, analogy in the military world and facing any kind of uh, enemy in the army, you have two ways to protect or to solve the problem. Is armor plating. You increase your armor plating process. Tanks. And there is ammunition. And you have a big competition between armor plating and ammunition. When you increase armor plating, then you increase the way the ammunition will pierce that. That's a classic syndrome. In the financial industry, we have the same thing. Armor plating is capital, assets. And here is risk management. And if we want to fight this risk, we have to find the proper balance between capital ratios and surveillance. The problem is that capital is a limited resource. Uh, you have raw material in the cement industry, which is sand, for instance, but in this industry, the raw material is capital, will be transforming capital. You have short-term capital, you have risk, go to go from risk to, to security, you need a capital uh, process. You need to, to transform short-term, long-term, and so on and so on. Then capital is the asset of this industry. Finance industry is an industry, engines, but it's fed by capital. But, in fact, you have two types of usage of this capital in the economy at large. Then you have prudential capital and you have productive capital. And as the amount of capital in a certain society is a fixed amount, more or less, if you increase the usage of capital frozen, frozen in the financial industry, then you have less capital in manufacturing for production. Then that's a very important concept because if you freeze too much capital in the bank, as it's done through Basel III and so on, then you will have a problem to finance properly growth. Then, as you can fight risk with uh, this arm, more capital ratios, and today there's some temptation with the politicians because it's easy to understand. You increase capital ratios and you increase the robustness of the system. 
But here you have a soft way to, to fight risk. Is, uh, is the ammunition, it's risk management. And risk management, there is two ways of risk management. There's external and internal. Internal is the regulator and the surveyors. And here, you, the, your answer in, in Russia is the mega regulator. Then it's all the process of external regulation, external surveillance. And if we observe what happened in the US or in England, is a failure of surveillance. Uh, one of the roots of the crisis is not just the lack of capital here, it's a failure of external surveillance from the FSA and from the SEC and the Fed in the US. If in France we haven't suffered much of this crisis, it's because we have a high level intrusive surveillance from the central bank. Okay? Then it's very important. But that is not enough. You need external surveillance with policemen and you need also internal processes, which is risk management. It's all the issues related to governance or financial institution. Okay. And here it's very important. The concept is risk appetite. If a society decides to have no risk, there will be no growth. No risk, stability means death. Okay? then you need to have some kind of dynamic. Then, at the level of a country, you have to define, Minister of Finance or Minister of Economy, have to define what is the level of risk. But when they define the level of risk, they have to define the process to cover this risk. Okay? Same thing that is coming from the political side, but the same thing coming at the institutional side. Each bank or each insurance company or each broker we have to define his risk appetite. That will be part of his strategy. Okay. Then he will define the risk appetite. And this risk appetite, we have to, to find processes or ratios or way to measure or to express this risk appetite. That is important that the academic work and the innovation side uh, will give tools to identify what is a risk appetite, how we can measure the risk appetite, and how a board will define the risk appetite. Then you will have to have a process where you have this definition of risk appetite defined by the board, and you have to express that in the different business lines, and then you have to measure the fact that in reality this risk appetite will be properly reported and managed. Then all the problem is the interrelation between the board, the executive side of the institution, and all the different business lines, and you will have intermediate structure, which will be risk department, compliance department, audit, that will manage and report to the board. And all that process is what will contribute to the robustness of the institution and uh, of, of the country. And there, there is a, lo a lot of work uh, today to really define what is the concept of this governance of risk, what is the nature of the risk chain, and how you, you can manage each risk link uh, interfering in it. and all that will be called the risk culture and what is important is not just the processes or the procedures it's also how the institution or collectively the financial industry share or not the same risk culture uh, in France we have a very strong risk culture and I will come back why uh, it's connected to uh, another concept, which is the universal bank. Okay.
that's one side of uh, of uh, this uh, strategy. You have an enemy, you have risk at the level of the society and the level of each institution. The objective is to optimize the allocation of assets uh, between prudential and production. Also, as I told you that capital is uh, uh, the commodity, is the raw material inside the bank. If you consume too much capital, your production, production price of services or instruments will be high. And today, because of increasing capital ratios, the cost of credit will increase. Okay? But the cost of uh, collateral will increase in derivatives, for instance, then the cost of derivative instruments will increase. Then how to optimize the usage of capital is a key component of the competitiveness <coughs> of the financial industry as a collectivity in the country and also it's a key component of the competitiveness of each banks or each insurance company. That's the relation between capital and Now, uh, another uh, concept is um, why what's happening today? Today we are just after this crisis, we are four or five years after the crisis. What have been, have been done during this period? During this period, we had a fire in all our countries. Then when you have a fire, as it's the case at home, you, you ask the fireman to come, and the fireman will extinguish the fire. That's exactly what has been done by the regulators all over the world. But the same as at home, when you, you have a fire, you have a fireman, then you have no more fire, but inside the home, it's a mess. The water all over, everything is broken, and so on and so on. That is exactly where we are today. We are, we, today, we have a lot of regulation and so on, but this regulation is not working anymore because we are going in uh, three types of equation, and what I call that is three plus three equal nine. Okay? It's the rule of nine. You have that in, uh, in mathematics, but we we'll see in finance how it is. Then, in this triangle, and all the problem in uh, time gaps is to manage the balance between contradictory forces, as in physics, all over the world is the same thing. Then, we have this triangle of forces with stability, solidarity, taxes, things like that, and growth. For the first four years after the crisis, the fireman reflex was to give priority to stability and solidarity. Then you had those forces going in that direction, and obviously the balance of the system was unbalanced. And that is phase one of the crisis. Now we are reaching phase two, and we are rediscovering that one of the objective is not just pure stability, as I said, but it's growth. Growth and, and employment. Then we have to rebalance those forces and define a strategy driven by growth preoccupation. And that is phase two. And because of this phase two, we have to revisit, we have to revisit the uh, regulatory framework that drive our countries to match toward a stability and non-growth prospects instead of going to growth. Then today, at least in Europe, and that will be important uh, for uh, the next, because as you know probably that uh, we have a parliament in Europe, and this parliament will be elected in next May. Then after that, we have a new European Commission, and 
what we are preparing today is to get out of this phase one driven by stability and try to trigger a new dynamic driven by growth and that will be and how we address that we are addressing that by a new strategy which is long-term investment strategy in those years 2000 uh, we have been driven by as i said complexity complex product now we have to be driven by simplicity but also we were driven by short termism now we have to invent new instruments which be simple instruments and also by long term perspective and long term investment is related to the lecture that is in the other room it's a fund management and all the fund management industry all the strategy that we are starting to have in in russia also is all about uh, pensions pension funds uh, we need to mobilize uh, uh, saving in long-term envelopes. Then long-term uh, investment strategy is a way to address the rebalancing of this triangle. Then to do that, there is another equation, another triangle. There is one there and the second one, the one there, second one. Well, that is very simple. Uh, if we want this growth, we have to reanalyze in a macro sense the challenges that we have in the society. There is three corners of this uh, challenge, which is the corporate need, the real economy, the corporate need. What do they need to finance their growth? What the ratio between the equities, uh, capital, debt, short-term debt, treasury debt, etc. Then we are following a lot of studies today to identify structurally what are the needs of our corporates in Europe or in France, and especially the SMEs. What is the need of financial input in this corporate world to grow? That is the need. Then the second Angle is the investors. Uh, sorry, uh, what's uh, SME? SMEs, uh, small and medium sized uh, enterprise, small companies, SMEs. We call that SMEs. As we, we focus on SMEs because, as they are the most fragile corporate of the society, uh, when you change the model of financing, they will probably suffer the first. And that's why it's very important for the dynamic of the society to have a real strategy to finance SMEs. The big corporate will find their way and find money in China or in America or I don't know what. They are less fragile. Even so, we have to put in perspective the needs of capital. Because as I said, uh, productive capital is key. And we have to find this productive capital to be sure that this productive capital will reach the users of the financial instruments or financial services, which are the corporate, the big, the medium, and the small. Okay. Then there is an issue here to analyze what is the need of those uh, users to be financed. The second dilemma is the investor side. Uh, the investor side is linked to the saving policy. In Russia, like in France, like in Europe, you have a high ratio of saving, which is good. It's not the same case in the US, they have a low level of saving. But here we have a high level of saving, but that's not enough. Because if this uh, saving, this, this money stay under the mattress, doesn't, uh, it doesn't serve the economy. Then the problem is, what is the saving strategy? In the saving strategy, you have two legs also. You have the domestic saving strategy and you have the global, meaning how you can use foreign savings to come in the system to feed and finance your corporation. Then you have this saving strategy. This saving strategy 
imply a lot of taxation processes, a lot of incentives to push the uh, citizens to organize their uh, assets in a proper way. If they need treasury, short term money, they have a deposit account, but if they need to invest uh, for the future, they will have to find the proper instruments to be sure that they maintain the value of the saving and they increase this, increase this value. Okay. Then it means all the strategy of the financial ministry around taxation and so on. But this saving has to be intermediated because there will be uh, uh, specialists, experts that will manage this saving and that you will have the insurance companies through uh, uh, life insurance, you have the pension funds, you have uh, uh, the fund managers. Okay? Then here what is to be analyzed is what is the conditions, economical conditions, to have the proper density of actors that will manage the savings. The problem today in Russia, for instance, is that you have a huge need here, but you have uh, undeveloped financial uh, fund management industry. And all the issue and priorities today is to reinforce this investment, uh, investment fund uh, business line. If you want. Then it's clear that obviously those objectives, the objective, the long-term objective of the investors don't match with the short-term objective or the long-term objective of the corporate. Uh, it's not, not much face-to-face. -face. That's why we need the third part of this triangle is intermediation. And we said that the financial industry is all about intermediating uh, contradictory aspect of the society. Then we need to intermediate the corporate needs and the investor needs. In between, we have the, the intermediaries. And these intermediaries is the banks, for instance. And there are several ways to intermediate, to bring this money there. Then there is two ways. There is the credit-driven intermediation, and there is the market-driven intermediation. And that's another important concept, because our societies are not all the same. In Europe, but it's more or less the same here, uh, in Europe our model is 80-20, meaning European economies are massively financed by credit and just financed by the market, capital market, bonds and equities, 20%. In the US, it's the reverse, they are 20-80, uh, meaning the US economy is massively financed by the market instruments. That's why when you make regulation, global regulation like Basel III, for instance, Basel III will not have the same effect in the structure of uh, European banks as in the structure of American banks. That's why it's important to have global principle and global concept, but when you apply that to economies, you have to adapt to the situation and it clearly uh, you cannot have just one approach of Basel III because it will not affect uh, those, uh, this financial industry the same way. But what's happening is that we mentioned the fact that we have those uh, firemen and uh, uh, driven by stability and we issued some regulation out of that. Even so we try to revisit this regulation because of growth driven uh, interest. Then this new regulation at the global level called uh, Basel III will change the model of how we are financing the economy. There will be an impact on that. Then we don't know exactly what is the nature of this impact, but it's clear that if we are coming from the structure which is 80-20, this structure will move, and probably one assumption could be that we can go from 80-20 to 
20, 30, 20, 30, 40. Okay. If we go in this direction, it's very important because it means that investment banking will be multiplied by two. And, and an, an industry that double in a short period of time, it's a real massive challenge. And there is a real risk. And you have risk of rupture in the financing chain if we don't address this evolution properly. That's why we are working on how, what is the new model. And this model, again, this new model will hit severely the SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. Then here you have another concept which is very important. Uh, we are coming from 20. Then there is 20 new business. There will be 20 less business for the credit for the classic banking industry, but there will be 20 more to be served. As we are in an open economy, you will have two types of competitors coming to get those new 20. That is the existing 20, that's the new 20. And obviously, on this race, competitive race, you have those guys, the investment bank that represent 20% of the economy, and you will have those other banks represent 80% from the economy. To simplify, you will have the BNPs, Paribas, uh, or Dresdner, or, or uh, Deutsche Bank, and here you will have the Goldman Sachs. Those two types of banks will race to get those, this market share. Then if we miss this term, mechanically, the winners would be the most strong institutions, which is the American institution. Then, for Europe, but the same for Russia, you will have this challenge. If we change this model and if we increase the role of capital market to finance the economy, how you will structure your financial industry to be sure that the Sverbank or the Troika or I don't know those banks would be able to take those shares. And that is very important because if you can outsource uh, textile to uh, China, if you outsource uh, M&A or investment banking to a foreign country, it's more dangerous because finance is a sovereignty tool in a way. Then it's very important for each country to, to decide either if they want to take the risk to outsource to Goldman Sachs or to define a strategy to help those guys to increase their market share. And that, again, is a question of uh, policy, because uh, if you want to have the critical mass, you need to put fuel in your pipes, uh, and fuel in those pipes is all these assets, this capital, that's the fuel. If you don't have a critical mass in the investment side, you won't be able to increase intermediation and to uh, finance your own company. Then there is a logic here to, to address the proper way to mobilize your own saving, uh, to be intermediated in certain ways, and to go to this. And that's why another aspect in the middle of that is market infrastructure. Uh, the financial industry is an industry. This industry needs uh, collective factories, engines, and highways. Then you have SWIFT, you have, but you have central bank as a payment factory. You have central depositories as uh, securities factory. Uh, you have uh, CCPs clearing uh, 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 clearing houses, either for payment or for securities, to diminish the risk. And then you need a strategy of your market infrastructure. You started this strategy here in, in Russia by merging in MySex your two big stock exchanges because it's also 
a, a game where critical mass matters. Then, through the recent regulation in, in Russia, you reinforce your stock exchange, you, you consolidated your CSDs, you consolidated your, uh, um, uh, how you call that, uh, registrar, uh, that uh, put the names of the different owners of securities, and also you have a strategy on CCPs. Okay, then you have that. Now, you have the, the fourth triangle, the third triangle, because you have one, which is this one, so, and that we have this one. And this one is about regulation, because we always speak about regulation, and people say, okay, it's over-regulation, not over-regulation, and so on. And that is also very important. And we have different approaches to regulation. Uh, and we have these approaches uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, where you go from uh, light-touch regulation to high-touch regulation. And that was the marketing uh, discourse in England, the city of London. They were selling light-touch regulation for a while, and now they are selling the high-touch regulation. Um, and in the US, you had the syndrome of Sarban Oxley when you had the Enron scandal. Uh, and now you have Dodd-Frank Act, uh, then you have the Sarban Oxley, uh, Dodd-Frank Act, and so on and so on. And what we think is that, in fact, you don't need to have those amplitude. You need to have what I call the smart regulation, which is a balanced regulation between contradictory interests. You have to balance your regulation to protect the investors, to protect the industry against explosion, and to be innovative friendly. That's the three characteristics of a good regulation. Then, to get this good regulation, there is some conditions. And that is this other triangle, if you want. You have the regu regulators, and you have the regulees, the ones which are regulated. And here, you have a dual syndrome, uh, if you can. That is the policeman, surveillance. And you have two approaches from the policeman to see what are the regulations. Either you conceive them as thieves, bad guys, the thieves, or the citizen. And if you have this construction of regulation where you think that those guys are thieves, you don't trust them, then you will have this regulation that you see in the Anglo-Saxon world. Sometimes the thief is winning on the policeman, and sometimes the, the policeman is winning. Uh, and each time, when the thief is winning, you have a major crisis, and that happens every 10 years in the US. Okay? Then, then we think it's better to build your system on a relation between the policeman and the citizen, to have this line. To do that, you need trust. You need a process that builds trust between the regulators and the regulators. And that's why I created an institute I call the European Institute of Financial Regulation in France. And this institute is a platform where we try to optimize a better understanding, uh, a mutual understanding between the regulators and the regulators over concrete operational implementation of regulation. When we installed uh, new models uh, around uh, uh, Basel III, for instance, then the people that uh, build up those models, they have to, to speak uh, in an academical way, not in a lobby way, with the regulators. Say, okay, I don't understand, does, uh, does this modeling doesn't work, and so on and so on. We need to have a uh, common understanding. And that is the condition for smart regulation. Okay. But there is another dimension, because we are in the global world, and that is interesting design inside your country. But as we are not just in one country, we have another concept. We have another concept, is that you have regulator of country one, 
and regulator of country two. And the problem that we have today is that those regulators don't trust each other. The American regulators don't trust the French regulator or the German regulator. Then they try to invent regulation because American regulators want to protect, to protect the American investors. And those American investors will transact with Europe or with Russia. Then the temptation of the American regulator to say, okay, I have to protect my Americans. Then I will define some regulation on Russian, Russian trade or European trade. And that we call extraterritoriality. But each, if each country goes in the same line and draw regulation with extra territorial, territorial features, the system is unmanageable. If, for example, you have CCPs, clearing house, in a clearing house you have the two legs of a transaction that have been net somewhere, but if the clearing house has to be regulated by the US, or then you will have a US clearing house and a European clearing house, but that will not match. But the function of a clearing house is to net two legs of one transaction. If you have different regulation, you can't, you can't net, then you can't have clearing houses. Then that's the limit. Then if we want to fight extra territoriality, which is a com common sense uh, objective, we need to build trust between regulators from different countries. And that is all the concept on which, on which we are working, which is mutual recognition. Recognition or functional equivalence of rules means that you need a dialogue to organize a dialogue between this regulator and this regulator to analyze the regulatory framework of each country and to decide that I recognize that the regulation in Europe, even so it's not exactly the copy of my regulation, but structurally this regulation will achieve the same result as my own regulation. Then when this job and analysis is done, then those regulators say, okay, I, I recognize your regulation and I will not ask my regulation to regulate what is happening in France or in Germany. I will rely on the French or German regulator to control what's happened because I know that this French regulator will do the job as well as myself. And that is a very important uh, aspect. Now we are getting out from the Dodd-Frank Act and we are starting to work with the Americans on this mutual recognition concept. What does it mean? How, what is the process to recognize that the regulation A equals regulation B? In the, not in, in, the, in the writing, but in the effect. Okay. That is uh, another uh, Absolutely a key uh, concept. Then, uh, maybe I will not stay too long, but um, what is important uh, to deliver uh, all that? It looks very simple, you see. Uh, to deliver that, what is important is creativity and innovation. You have to be innovating, innovative in the way you will invent properly the proper instrument of services in the investment side. We have to invent new instruments in the derivative side or in the credit side to deliver credit or the payment side to use mobile phone uh, uh, to pay. Uh, uh, we need a lot of innovation uh, to simplify instruments addressing very complex situation of the customer. That means a lot of innovation. And 
to do all those things, uh, in the middle of that is the major role of what I call the financial center. For us, the financial center is the structure that will bring around the table all those different components. And that is what we are doing in Paris Europlace, which is very different from the city of London, for instance. The city of London is just the financial industry that organizes itself to compete, uh, to compete in the world. Our financial center is an institution that tries to bring the corporates, the banks, the investors, and also the regulators, the politicians, we have the French Treasury, we have the governor of the central bank, we have all those things, those, those people. And collectively, we try to address all those issues and define, uh, and define a common strategy. And I will just finish with that. And uh, the financial center is perceived as a, a company delivering services. Either we deliver the proper services and then people will be in France or we don't deliver the services and they will be in Zurich or in, in London or in the US or in Moscow. And to, to manage that, we have four business lines. And all those business lines are driven by one word, which is innovation. Then we have one business line, which is structural innovation, is where we try to be innovative to define the optimum, optimum structure of the financial industry to address the objective of the financial industry to finance the real economy. This structural innovation process is either at the level of G20, how we help the G20 to be innovative, to invent the real concept, to address the compatibility of all the different countries. Then we have the European compatibility, how we'll be able to bring the 28 countries sharing the same set of rules. Uh, at the European level, because that's the French financial center, at the European level, we are defining uh, European virtual financial center. What we are saying is that collectively, Europe is a financial center, but it's nowhere. This financial center is a combination of a rule book of uh, regulatory authorities, then we have uh, European regulatory authorities, not anymore each country's authorities, regulatory authorities, and market infrastructure. Uh, and, and that creates the perception from abroad, from Russia or US, that Europe is a real financial center because we have one rule book, uh, one set of regulators and authorities, and one set of market infrastructure. And this uh, European financial center is structured around physical financial center, which are Paris, London, Madrid, uh, Stockholm, and so on and so on. Then we have a network of financial centers because the idea, again, is not to have just one big financial center in Europe, for instance in London, but is to adapt, uh, adapt the, modern the modern world, and the modern world is based on networks, and networks bring expertise near the users. If we had just one financial center somewhere in Europe. There will be a concentration of financial expertise in one side, but there will be no more expertise in, Vars in Warsaw or in, uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia, or I don't know what. Then that's not good. That, the idea is to have one strong financial center at the center of Europe and to be able to propagate this expertise 
on the European territory. And, and, and that's what we are doing in France by organizing our own financial center with this, this, uh, this structure. And that is very important. That's why also I am here, because that here I mentioned the European network of financial centers. But as we are in a globalized world, we have the same thing. We need also to have other financial centers in the world, Russia, Shanghai, and New York, uh, developing uh, in the planet based on compatible, compatible rules. And then for our compatible financial center, we have structural uh, innovation, we have uh, research in innovation, that is a platform that try to transform academical research towards the real life and how we can finance research and how we can leverage research to the financial world. And that's why we have this third uh, business line, which is entrepreneurial innovation. It's a cluster how we can transfer the result of the research to create innovative project, startups. That's why I'm here also organizing a conference uh, day after tomorrow, bringing 20 French startups to uh, try to partner with Russian entrepreneurs. Uh, and then uh, startup is very important, uh, entrepreneur innovation and international innovation, how we can innovate to share all this expertise, to be sure that we can propagate all over the world the best practices by sharing experiences. That's why uh, I'm here and, uh, and many times in, in, in Russia. Okay, I think I covered a, a lot of uh, concept. Uh, the, idea of, the idea of that is uh, at the end to uh, address this time gap to address risk and to be sure that the financial industry will properly finance the real economy because after all that is the mission of financial industry and to do this very simple thing you have to go through those, uh, all those different reasoning. Okay, thank you. Now if you have questions, happy to answer. You have mentioned about uh, <coughs> the shares of credit-driven and market-driven uh, intermediation in the uh, United States and Europe. So what about Russia? Uh, what, uh, uh, Russia, you are, you are credit-driven too. Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 so market, like the uh, like European Union? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you are credit-driven. But see, I don't know exactly what is the 8020. Uh, but probably you are 90-10, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, your challenge uh, in Russia is to reinforce, maybe it's 10 here, maybe it's 90 here, uh, you have to reinforce the capital market side of Russia. You, uh, uh, the bond market is not sufficient, the, the way you finance by equities uh, or your corporation is not, uh, because you still have a lot of public corporations and it's more financed by by the state than by uh, the saving by investors then you have to increase your engine here your stock exchange engine and that's based on the trust uh, uh, based on the on the uh, ownership law uh, because when you buy a security it's important to know that you you, you are the real owner, then you have security on, have on your own. Then all that is under uh, construction here. And you have to work on this, this side, which is uh, the investor side. Uh, and there is a lot of reform engaged today in Russia about uh, how to uh, redefine uh, uh, the pension fund, the voluntary pension fund versus the mandatory pension funds and so on. Then then you have to work on this envelope because there is a lot of saving, but this saving is not going there. Then, then you have to manage a proper way to have this intermediation process work better. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, 
a new reform on gauge, and that was the, the, one of the work of uh, Mr. Baloshin. There is a roadmap uh, defined, and you have to implement this roadmap, and like that, you will be able to uh, to, to, to intermediate on this process. Okay, thank you. Last question about innovations. Usually, when people talk about innovations, they mean innovations in the financial industry. Uh, but if you think about innovations in financial regulation, what's your opinion? What were the most important innovations recently? And what are the most important innovations which we need, which could, be, which could come in the future? Uh, there is innovation in different uh, uh, compartments of the thing. But one, one type of innovation in regulation what will be important is that, for instance, in the investment side, when you have a citizen that will invest in a fund, he will take a risk in this fund. And then that's why we invented a, a risk-free fund, which is fund covered by, uh, by derivatives, with, which we call that guarantee funds. And guarantee funds is a complex product. Then we have a contradiction because you have a fund that is nice for a non-expert citizen because it's a guarantee. But as the guarantee is complex, there is some complexity or difficulties for a normal citizen to understand the process of the guarantee. Then. The temptation of the regulator is to say, we have to sell very simple product to simple people. But the problem is that the simple people need complex product because they need a guarantee. And the more they are not rich or simple, the more they need security. But today, the process of regulation is, is, is the contrary. They say the simple people need a simple product, then no guarantee. There is a contradiction. Then we need some innovation, for instance, in regulation, to define how the regulator will validate a complex product, meaning we don't ask the citizen to understand the model of this complex product, but we need that the regulator understand the complexity and the model, and validate, not just the model, but validate that what the marketing guy of the investment company sells will be true. And it means that we don't ask anymore the citizen to understand the complexity, but we ask, we ask the regulator to take the risk, to say, I take the risk that I understand that this proposal is a good proposal for the simple people. And that is not at all what the regulator is doing. Then in this area, for instance, it's just to illustrate the question, we need more innovation and we're not yet there. And today we are in the reverse and, and the regulators try to say, no, 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 we have to simplify the complexity of the product and we just permit that the rich people use guarantees because it's a complex product and the poor people don't use this guarantee, which is a contradiction then that's an example where we need some innovation to simplify to an, this, this, this uh, uh, intermediation process. But we need the uh, same thing in the Basel III. Uh, Basel III is a very complex tool, for instance, too complex, and we have to work on the liquidity ratio, for instance then we need more innovation from the regulator side to define what are the proper tools to really make this industry more robust, but using another way than purely increasing the capital ratios. Because the simplicity for them, say, I have a problem, I will increase capital ratio. That's easy. But if uh, they want to find an optimized way to reinforce robustness and at the same time make some economy in the capital ratios, they have to work. We need innovation there. For instance, today, we don't reach the right balance. Okay, that's two examples where 
We need interference between innovation and regulator. But also, you need innovation because regulator, you have the regulator and the, and the, and the surveillance processes. Sometimes it's the same body. But when you will have uh, 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 market abuse processes, uh, market abuse is very interesting, very complex, but how the regulator will detect market abuse? That needs a lot of uh, IT tools, uh, application, modeling, to understand in the millions of transactions what are the correlation between those transactions that are triggered by some abuses. Then here, that's another sphere where we need innovation to give proper tools to the policemen to detect abuses. Uh, uh, that's where there is a real and uh, at uh, the financial authority in France or the prudential authority in France too, there is a scientific uh, board where they try to gather around themselves a researcher to help them to uh, address those, uh, those challenges. Uh, it's not yet done. It's, it's still difficult uh, because you, you have a policeman, but it is a very modern world then you, you, you don't have a police on a horse now anymore. You, have, you, know, you need a, a, a technological policeman uh, with a laser and things like that. Uh, we have to invent all those tools. Okay. That's an uh, example. Any questions? Let me ask the final question about Russia, about our financial center. So if you believe in a bright future of the Russian Financial Center, uh, what could be the niche for uh, our Financial Center? So if it's going to you know, take its place among the leaders, uh, what, could, what could be such a place? Yeah, uh, that was a question that had been uh, asked uh, this conference organized by uh, the city of Moscow two days ago, uh, last week. Uh, first, there is a confusion when we say Moscow as a financial center. If you say, say Moscow and where is it located, for instance, and so on and so on. Uh, it's a concept, obviously. And when we speak about Moscow as a financial center, we speak about Russian regulation, obviously. Uh, all those things is not about Moscow, it's about Russia. Uh, then, uh, obviously, uh, the, the Russia regulatory framework will be incarnated somewhere in a Moscovite uh, institution, probably, to manage all those things, then uh, it's clear it's not Moscow, it's Russia. Now, the other ambiguity is, we say, uh, international center. International center. In reality, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what means international. Uh, and I don't think that's the most important issue. The, the first issue, uh, especially because in the, in the UK, for instance, they, they, are, they speak about market share. And for them, if Shanghai increase or Moscow increase, they will lose market share because of today a lot of Russian money is processed in, 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 in the UK. Then there is a contradiction because that is good for London, it's not good for Russia. Then all the objective of a Russian financial center is to bring back Russian assets to finance Russian economy. Doing that, obviously, you will increase the global market, uh, market share of Russia and you will decrease the market share of London. But that is good, because the question is not about market share. The question, as I've said, is how you disseminate financial centers near the users of finance. And that's why it's very important that first, the Russian financial center address the need of the Russians. And as Russia is a big economy, progressively, if you do that, you will be able to count among the big financial centers because you will be bigger than a smaller country. It's more related to the size of your economy than to the size of your financial center. If you are a big economy, your financial center will be big. Now, also, the problem is uh, international financial center because you will attract, because if you need foreign assets to finance your corporate, you need to attract global investors. 
and it's important uh, to be uh, uh, in the map of those uh, global investors because those global investors need diversity. They have to share risk between different uh, baskets, the uh, American risk, the European risk, the uh, Russian risk, the Chinese risk. Then for them it's very important in for diversification to address that. But if they want to put some of their money here, you need to have trust. You need to define that all this process with market infrastructure and so on is based on compatible global principles driven by the G20 and uh, uh, FSB and all those structures. Okay. Then, if you are a robust financial center defined by the size of your economy, which is a big economy, and if you have the uh, compatible uh, best practices and infrastructure and so on and so on, then the global investors will put their money in your stock exchange and go to finance your corporation. That is this. Now, also, it's clear that Paris is not London, it's not Frankfurt, and Moscow will not be Paris or London or New York or Zurich. Then it's important to define what will characterize Moscow in this global sphere. And the recommendation I try to, to make is that one of the specificity of uh, Russia is energy and agriculture. Then you should try to find ways to develop derivatives, for instance, uh, derivatives in energy uh, or derivatives in agriculture. Today, uh, Chicago is very strong on agriculture and derivatives too, but you can invent uh, a process that you take uh, a market share in uh, the energy sector or in the agricultural sector, for instance, especially if you make some alliances with Kazakhstan, which is very strong also in energy and in uh, uh, agriculture. That, that, that's why you have to, to, uh, to cross-fertilize uh, between uh, all those countries which are not very far from Russia to reinforce some specificities. But I think in those fields, uh, Moscow can find uh, something. And that's why also um, in our old countries we have a lot of legacy, meaning we have a lot of applications, software, and so on and so on, and we have uh, layers of old structure. And that also is, is, uh, is a problem because it, it, uh, we are less flexible to new type of things. As you start more recently, you have less legacy, obviously, then uh, your challenge is to try to catch up the best technologies right away. Then if you base all your risk modeling, risk management, derivatives, market, and so on, based on the most recent technologies, then you can race with the first group, obviously, because you will have the same tool. That's why I am bringing also those uh, French uh, entrepreneurs to cross-fertilize our new technologies with uh, the, Russian tech, uh, to the Russian entrepreneur and increase this uh, uh, innovative curve uh, in Russia. Uh, and if you do that uh, with research and uh, entrepreneurship, then you can also uh, win uh, uh, some, uh, some, some uh, place in this race. So there is hope. Yeah, and, and anyway, you have to be optimistic. Oh, yeah. That's also the key, uh, the key uh, of uh, winning battles. Uh, sometimes in our elite, people are always septic, 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 and uh, if you are too septic, you want to win the battle. Then we have to be not naive, <coughs> but optimist. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for this piece of paper. So let's thank the speaker. Good.